started forming an escape plan from the moment I walked in. Every system has a weakness. I was going to cut my way out. Monte, you there? If someone would escape from our facility, someone's going to have to get hurt. This is a true story. It's a dramatized account based on the escapee's own recollections in letters and phone calls. He's not going to go easy. May have a gun and may want to go down in a firefight. My name is Quante Adams. I'm 30 years old. January 2004, I was arrested by federal agents for drug conspiracy, possession of 1,400 pounds of marijuana, and money laundering. I'd already been in jail two years just waiting to get to trial. I was facing a life sentence. My father and his brothers were the original founders of the Crips in Compton, East Los Angeles. I grew up amongst that. Everybody molded me to be a hardcore child, selling drugs from 10 years old and doing time when I was 14. I've been locked up for 16 of the last 19 years. When I was in county jail, I tried to escape a couple of times. I'd been caught with little hacksaw blades and different things. So I was transferred to the maximum security federal wing at Alton Jail. Everybody thought it was impossible to escape from. At the time he arrived, the only thing we knew about Quante was what the marshals had told us at that time. And that, and they said that he was uh, an escape risk with a prior attempt. As I get near, I'm looking at the height of the building. I'm counting bricks to determine how many square feet the rooms are. I'm looking at the ventilation system. I'm looking at cameras. I'm trying to see every little thing that I can. Because I mean, I'm going to try to escape regardless. They had cameras everywhere. All the doors were pretty much high tech, you know. It was a real high tech jail. But. There wasn't enough monitors to watch every cell. Okay, uh, name? Quante Adams. Age? 30. Marital status? Single. Okay, number of kids? One. I had a child that never held in my arms. Just after I was arrested, I found that I was going to be a father. I couldn't be going to prison for life now. They gave me toiletries, toothpaste, dental floss, what have you. But you know, everything you get in prison can be used in some way to help you escape. Bolton Jail is very secure. We have a brand new building, all state-of-the-art camera equipment. We can see 24 hours a day in the cells, lights on, lights off. We go to great lengths to prevent someone from escaping. As I'm walking to the cells, I'm trying to study every little thing. The doors, the buzzers, the sound of the buzzers. I go through three doors, and I turn a corner, and I'm into a corridor with 13 cells six or seven on the side. And walking. There's a lot of shouting going on. What's your name? Where are you from? One of them I knew from the segregation wing at the county jail. With the video system in the booking area, we have the monitor set up to where we can see the cell blocks, see into the cells. How's the new guy shaping? We're constantly looking at those. He's certainly not camera shy, that's for sure. Sitting in your cell, 
you can hear the guards approaching every time. I've got three buzzers before anyone gets to my cell. I realized their security system could be my early warning system. Hey, Mr. Quante. The warden, he came to me. We're keeping a very close eye. He pretty much told me all this stuff about, you know, that I'll never get out of his jail, so don't think about it. If a prisoner was going to escape from the Alton jail, they would have had to physically assault one of my correction officer staff, take the keys from them to go out a series of doors. And I know all my jail staff well enough to know that that's not going to be an easy task for someone to do. If someone, Quante or whoever else, would escape from our facility, someone's going to have to get hurt. They searched my cell every day, shake my cell down. Just making sure that you're still here, Quante. Make sure there's no escape routes or anything like that. They joke with you, but they're serious at the same time. We did everything we could to keep an eye on him. 24 hours a day. If you've got cameras, you're watching the prison, right? But relying on the cameras was really a weakness. They can't see what a person would see. I laid in my cell for months, just listening and imagining and visualizing, using common sense to try and create an image of what's going to be up in the roof. Piping, water sprinkler piping, ventilation systems, and all that. Every little thing that plays a part in creating a vivid description of what you're going to actually encounter when you plan an escape. You try to study the piping and plumbing of the building. You listen to sound and see how it travels through the cell. I'm paying attention to every little thing. When it would rain outside, I could smell this distinct smell, rain on concrete. And that reminded me. It made me know for sure that there was an exhaust fan up there in the roof. So I just wanted to follow that smell. I knew there was a way out. Of course, I'm looking for an exit. But there are three different doors, and every time you move, you have to be shackled. I never thought about tunneling my way out. The chief of police was underneath me. But maybe I could go through the roof. If I'm looking at the monitor and I don't see an inmate, I will get on the intercom. Quante, how we doing, buddy? Generally, they're buried under their covers or they're using the restroom. Leave me alone, Mike. I'm on the can. One thing I noticed, the camera didn't include the toilet. So if the guard was looking on the screen of your camera, he's not going to be worried when he thinks you're using the toilet. The blind spot behind the toilet was kind of small, but I thought I might just be able to cut a hole up there I could squeeze through. My problem was that the roof was solid steel, and I needed a tool to cut my way out with. There was nothing I could use in the cell. Everything was built with security in mind. There was a built-in toilet and a phone for making collect calls, but it was buried into the wall. No wires, no cords I could use, nothing. Every morning at 7 a.m., we, we'll begin their one hour of rec time, starting with uh, each cell. I knew how to get a blade. I'd done it before. I got it sent through the mail. But I couldn't do that here. Security was too tight. Hey, Quante, ain't no place to run, brother. And then it came to me. I reckon that brother's in training for the 2050 Olympics. Maybe I could get a book sent to another inmate. But I didn't trust any of them. I didn't want to rely on anyone. Then I thought, maybe, maybe, I didn't even have to know it was coming. I need a blade. I'm the only one to hear that's right. I was real nervous waiting. I didn't know if the book was going to get x rayed. I didn't know if the guy would say, I didn't order this, I don't want this. I knew that if they found the blade, they would somehow suspect me and my security level would be raised sky high. So I knew that if the blade didn't get through, everything would fail. 
Man walking. The other inmate wasn't even aware the book was coming in. Man walking. Nor was he aware that there was a hacksaw blade inside of the book. Hey, Vin. I didn't know you were such a deep thinker. Modern ethics. I knew if the book didn't get through, I wouldn't be getting out. What's the conundrum? I don't know. Enjoy. You can't give any signs of your plan. You gotta appear normal. Once the book was sent in, I waited. I waited a week or so. Then, hey, Vinny. I tried to get the book passed. Can I get a read of that book you got sent? Murley took the book. I had to get the blade out as quickly as I could. Hide it. Destroy the evidence. There it was. I didn't know if it was a setup to where the police were going to come rushing in and get the blade for me. I wanted to make sure that I didn't get caught with anything, not even a paperclip. When I actually got the blade, I was a little nervous and excited. I didn't know for sure my plan was going to work. I'd observed the roof. I was thinking I could cut my way through the ceiling and make my way out through those vents. I put the blade to the ceiling, and it sounded loud. What's that noise? You drilling for oil? You going to read, buddy boy? You in there? You done yourself a tunnel already? I was surrounded by 18 other inmates. At least 14 of them were snitches, looking to go tell and get a time reduction. So I thought, the only way I could cut at the ceiling was when things were really loud on the corridor. I had to get them to cover for me. I would get them to cause a distraction without them realizing. These guys are bored out of their minds. Would do anything to keep entertained. Victor! Let me hear something, man. Oh, Quante, I got something new for you. I just wrote a new verse. I'd get people making music, rapping. When in my zone, let me loose. You're on your own. Try to take God my damn. throne. I climb mad uh, when I you ride. Know the lyrics all wrong. Hey, yo, CJ. Show Victor how it's done. Harmonized tones, mine's gone ballistic. It's gonna stop a politician, like which is up a mystic. So you had her, all these cells blowing up at the same time. Everybody would get louder and louder and try to be heard, and the louder they got, the less I could be heard. It got more to be like a battle rap, you know? Like MCs who battle each other. Exactly. Use your brain as you I think it took like five days of scratching and scraping and digging and all that. And then finally, I got the blade all the way through. Now I was excited. I had thoughts of being with my daughter, being on a beach. I had to find a way to mask the cut and seal it. Every time I'd go for a shower, I would just take all the soap with me. The stuff you find in prison, it's all useful. I mix soap and toothpaste to make a kind of, of a paste that would cover up the saw marks in the ceiling. It took me time to get the paste right so it would stick up there. So long as I listened out for the buzzers, I knew I was hidden from the camera. I'd start at two o'clock and go through three and four in the morning. When they were quiet, I'd have to go slower. It could take an hour just to get some little scrapes off. But I figured it was better than laying down and doing nothing. You know what? I'm right, you're wrong. Never. After three weeks of cutting, I was finally through. Steel came away in my hands. I'm right, you're wrong. And I felt a rush of excitement. I knew I was on my way. Freedom was on the other side of that hole. I could hear the guard getting closer. And I still couldn't get the piece of it back in the ceiling. I was panicking. Man, walk. 
I ran to the door to block the hole from the guard. What you been doing in there? I'm just standing right in front of the window so he can't see the hole in the cell. I'm willing to do whatever it takes now. To put everything I've got on the table in order to get my freedom. Once I pushed up the hatch, it was dark up there. No light, just a light coming up from my cell. I wanted to see if there was room enough for me to crawl around up there. I knew that if they called me and the cell looked empty, I had some time because I think I was using the toilet. I was expecting that once I got the hole open, that I would instantly see a ray of sunshine, some light shining in. But actually, when I'm crawling around, I can't make anything out. pretty much heartbroken that they didn't seem a way out from the ceiling cavity. I've been working for three weeks, and I mean, I'm lucky enough to go that long without them discovering any of the cutting in the ceiling. It was like, you know, you're just like you want to give in. You become real depressed like your whole world just collapsed. Then, something told me, hey, you came this far, I just gotta keep fighting. I'm thinking, there's got to be a way out to that vent I saw when I came into the prison. So maybe, just above my cell, there's another level which will lead to that vent. I didn't want to rely on just hearing the three buzzers. I knew they came around every 30 minutes, so I'd give myself just 25, and I'd count it out, second by second. One. Two, three, four. I started pushing on the roof and started beating on it. And I noticed that it wasn't the absolute top of the roof. I'm thinking, there's something above this. So I broke a piece of metal off of something that was up there and started like, chiseling. Vincent, just been thinking it right, we taking over the Iraqi nation? We got every right to be over there. I was always looking for ways to create some kind of a distraction so I could get back up into the roof space. Come on, the war was a setup, Vincent. You know that, man. You know that was a setup, man. So I started working away at the roof. And before I knew it, I made a hole in it. To my surprise, it started to get air. But I said, you know, this has to be it. Then I felt a little piece of like cotton or insulation that came back through. And then, you know, I got a little bit excited and I made the hole big enough where I could stick my head through. And there it was. This is a dramatized account of a prison break based on letters and phone calls with escapee Quante Adams. He's just cut a hole in the steel ceiling of his cell. I seen that light, and I'm like, that's what I was looking for. I got happy. I got happy as hell. I seen that light, I'm like, hell, there they are. The vents I was looking for. All that stood between me and freedom with some metal I could cut through in a few seconds with my blade. But I need to spend time up there, watching and planning. I was gonna make a rope out of my blanket, cut open the vent and scale down the building. But 
I didn't want to get out of the prison and be stuck with no place to go. I wanted to make sure that I would have a ride. I didn't want to put myself in a situation where I had to carjack or take something from some innocent person. I could have called someone from back home to pick me up, but when I escaped, I was anticipating the police would put everyone I knew and trusted under surveillance. So that was a real problem. And then, I got lucky. Looking to correspond with single black male. Obviously was feeling lonely and I just wanted someone to take care of. I've dated pretty much every race there is, except black men. And I just wanted to see if, you know, if they were different than, you know, the white, the Caucasian man, the Asian man, and the, the Indian man, and the Puerto Rican man that I dated. Maybe she her a call once, eh? She might just be my ride. Another inmate told me, if you could get into your phone and move the jacks around, you could pretty much get free calls. It meant they wouldn't be able to trace who you were making calls to, though I couldn't be totally sure about that. Hello? And I heard this most angelic voice come over the phone, and he's like... I saw your ad in the newspaper. It was just so sweet. You wouldn't correspond with me? You know, I... I will. <laughs> okay. So what do you do? I mean, what do you do for fun? How do you keep yourself busy? I just made up stories, basically. You know, there's a lot of parties that we go to around here. And I thought that he would like me more if I did that. He was just tired of the jail game. He just wanted to find someone and be in a stable home environment. He liked older women. It was like he was a little boy just needing his mommy. But I, I mean, I did have a love for him. What she wanted from me? I guess she wanted to hang out with me, a date or whatever, and you know, probably sex and different things like that. Told me that he was in Alton, and I'm like, oh, that's not that far, you know. I want to come see you. He didn't want me to come. I told her not to come. Because I'm thinking if she does come to the prison, she'll have to leave her address, license details. She'll be leaving a trail. I'm here to see Quante Adams. I don't know if I'm really that naive and gullible or if he just had some kind of charismatic power over me that I just wasn't thinking right. I just had in my head that he was a sweet, innocent person that had been wrongly imprisoned. All right, come with me. Mike came and said, Got a visitor. I wasn't expecting her. What'd she look like? She pretty much put the thumbs down like, you know, you're not going to be happy what she looks like. I didn't care what she looked like. She had pretty much an open mind and an open spirit. So that was a good thing to me. Hi. <laughs> Hi. I'm fine, thanks. I was, uh, I was gonna dress trashy. It's okay. I prefer classy to trashy. <laughs> thanks. He asked me to stand up and turn around. Okay. <laughs> I guess so he could check out the merchandise. I don't know. This window was big enough. 
and there are no bars there, no guards around me, I would jump through. <laughs> well, you let me know if you decide to do that, and I'll be there to catch you. <laughs> so, you know, I took that as a sign that if I want to leave here, you're going to be here to give me a ride or to take me or hide me or whatever. I remember tracing his lips on the, uh, on the glass. But I thought he was very handsome, and it was just his voice. His voice is what um, just really touched my heart, my soul. I want to see. Sometimes he would, you know, call me like two or three in the morning, five in the morning. Hello. Oh, hey. I never could figure out how he was able to do that. Yeah, sure, that would be, that would be great. I'd like to come back. He was telling me, you know, he had a lot of faith in his lawyer that, you know, he had been unjustly incarcerated and that he would be kidding out. Hey, Quante, how's your girlfriend? I didn't completely trust the phone, even though I had rigged it. So I needed to find another way of getting information to Tanya. I mouthed to her a few things that I was going to be leaving in the next few days. She read my lips and I told her that I need a ride. He showed me an envelope. He was holding an envelope and um, he was pointing to the stamp on the envelope repeatedly to let me know that there was a message under the envelope. But I was thinking it was, you know, I love you, so sucks you into windows or something to that effect. You know, she pretty much looked and said, okay, yeah, I know, I get your meaning. I was breaking my golden rule. You can't trust anybody. That's probably the worst, the worst decision I made right there. Quante Adams is attempting to break out of Alton Jail, Illinois. He's hidden a secret message for Tonya Goodwin underneath a stamp. I walked out the door and got in the car and then immediately I looked under the, the stamp of the envelope. I was expecting secret I love yous. It had on there if Quante calls or anyone from my family calls and says that I'm getting out, then I need you to pick me up at the corner of Washington and Broadway. It was a little, you know, downheartening. I pretty much had everything covered now. But one thing bothered me, the 30 minute checks. I needed more time than that to get away before the alarm was raised. I thought maybe I could construct some sort of a dummy so it looked like I was sleeping in my bed when they came on their rounds. I'm thinking I'm going to be leaving soon. It'll probably work. Hello? Oh, hey. I'm probably going to be getting out soon. I felt very scared knowing that he was going to be released soon. Okay. I was afraid that he wasn't going to be able to get a job and we would become agitated with each other. And I was just worried about how our cohabitation was going to work out. I told him, I said, you can stay in the spare room. And he's like, no, I want to stay in your room. And I'm like, are you sure? I was still wondering what to do about the dummy when I caught a break. One day, when I got my laundry bag, there were extra clothes in there. So I filled up the pants on the top with the insulation that I found in the roof. And then I took a cracker box to make the head and a chest piece for the nose. Then I took a t-shirt and made a do-rag to put over the head. I was planning to have the head face away from the camera anyway. I made the pieces I needed and left them all up there on the roof. 
<laughs> How am I going to explain him to everybody? <laughs> I don't know. No one knew about him. I was hoping that I could rely on her. All I wanted was a ride for when I bust out. He told me one day that he was going to make me love him. Yeah. I thought to myself, I already do, but I didn't tell him. The last couple of days before I left, I spent as much time as I could up in the roof and I observed. I decided that I was going to leave tomorrow night, no matter what. Everything was leading up to this. All the months of preparation. I was very calm and relaxed, but I knew that if I was caught, I'd be transferred to a federal supermax prison where I'd have no chance of escaping. Man walking! I ate a little bit, not too much. And I had me a cup of coffee because I wanted to, you know, make sure that I was kind of amped up that night. I didn't take you for a coffee drink, Quante. In case I'd stay up as late as possible. My shift began at uh, 6 p.m. Uh, a few arrests. It wasn't very busy. It wasn't overwhelmingly busy. Looking back at it now, I, you know, you remember that Quante was generally always standing in his window, looking like he was talking with someone else. You gonna be ready for me? Okay. He called me and he said, I'm getting out. Could you pick me up? And I'm like, sure. There was really nothing unusual about that night. It's just a, just a normal night. I leave the home. It takes approximately 45 minutes. I was excited. I wanted to be able to you know, physically touch him. I just wanted him to be free. Around 8 o'clock, I cut my blanket into little strips, and I tied each strip together. I made like a long rope out of it. There was a guy there. I had him harass the guard. They ain't giving you your mail. That's against the law. Morelli! He pushed his button and he started to yell at the guard who was watching the camera. Why are you not giving me my letters? Because once you press your button, they're going to be there at your cell to see what's going on with you. So I covered my camera up, brought the dummy down, and then uncovered the camera again. Arrive in Alton, and he, you know, he calls and tells me what to do, and I follow his instructions. And then he instructs me to, to park on Washington Street, and that he'd be out in a few minutes. I was excited knowing that he was going to be released soon. I got cable, the cable he wanted. I even bought groceries. <laughs> As soon as Morelli's done the rounds, I'm out of the blocks. I'm moving fast, but I'm real methodical in what I do. Body first, head next, then arms. I need the dummy to buy me time. It's gotta look good. I take the plate down, I'm through the ceiling. Along the crawl space, into the roof, and across the vent as fast as I can go. I'm thinking, will the guard spot the dummy in my cell? Am I going to be seen as I come out? Will Tanya even be there? I was sitting in the vehicle. I turned it off. And out of the corner of my eye, I kept seeing something move. I looked over towards the jail. And the middle louver, I kept seeing someone pull it down and looking out. Across the street, a truck was coming up that alley, and the truck had bright lights, and the lights just shined right on the vent. I hoped, I just hoped he didn't see that. So I removed the vent and threw down the rope. And then I seen someone come flying out the top, spelunking down off the side of this jail. It was, it was hard to believe. My heart sunk. I slid down the rope so fast, I burned the palms of my hands. I just dropped. Oh my God. 
I just can't believe this is happening. That's when I realized, oh my gosh, he just broke out of jail. Unlock the door! Come on, what are you doing? Open the door. Quante Adams has just escaped from Alton Jail, Illinois. An unwitting accomplice is acting as his getaway driver. We both touched the door at the same time. Our hearts both sunk, but for different reasons. Unlock the door. My heart sunk because it was this. That's when I realized, oh my gosh, he just broke out of jail. Unlock the door! I thought she was real nervous. Unlock the door! Unlock the door! What are you doing? Unlock the door! She should have had the door unlocked. And then I had just seen this sad look on his face. And I, you know, I let him in. Oh my God, you know, I just can't believe this is happening. He's like, well, I thought you knew. I hadn't, I did not have a clue. I had no clue. Once they got in, I thought I had just got in too deep already. I couldn't, I couldn't go back. I'm thinking she's real panicky. a.m. is when the local radio station comes to take the names of the people who are there for petty offenses and they broadcast on the radio. Hey Mike, how you doing? He asked me. You doing any construction work outside? Why? And he said that there was something hanging from the air vents. I just went numb. Everything kind of stopped for a second and you get the oh no feeling. Your heart is in your stomach, the bottom of your stomach. Oh. It's gotta be Quante Adams. I banged on the door and yelled his name. Quante! Quante! Quante did not respond. Quante! It looked like what it had looked like the entire night. You could hear the sound of paper. You could see the cup fall on the floor and you knew it was a, just a, a dummy. It made it look like him. answered the phone knowing that something was probably wrong somewhere. Mike, what's up? And the first thing he says is, Quante has escaped. I physically thought I was going to throw up. After I hung up the phone with right, Mike, thanks. I called the captain, deputy chief, and the chief. Get him right up out of bed. All right, good. Bye. My realization came from being woken up and told that we had uh, an escape at the jail. It was a very strange feeling. Obviously, we believed it would be difficult, if not impossible, to escape from the jail if procedures were followed. Are we going to go to my house? We're going to come there. My plan was to hold up nearby, get on the phone, get somebody reliable to pick me up. Watch you in a motel room for a couple of days until things calm down. I needed to get off the road fast. I don't care what time it is, Murray. I need roadblocks set up every access road in and out of Alton, and I want it done now. It was uh, hectic when I arrived. Um, I went directly into the command center, and then I went up to the jail. I wanted to see everything myself. Huh. Is that the side we got out? Where did you get a hacksaw? All right, come on, let's get out of here. We needed to try to narrow a time frame down. If a few minutes have gone by, then the prisoner is nearby. If he's been gone for half an hour and could be maybe 30 miles away, you have a 60 mile in diameter circle to be searched. If you get two hours out and you're looking at 120 miles or farther away, this becomes geographically impossible. We were already in the geographic impossibility of securing the, uh, a perimeter circle. Obviously, we were very, very concerned. I was scared. I knew it was very serious that 
wanted to keep him protected too. I didn't, you know, I wanted to keep him hid. I was real wary. I needed to reach out to someone to come get me. What's going on with the video? We began looking at any other source of information that we could gain that would give us any insight into where he might have gone and who had contact with him. Some of those things would be the records of the phone calls that he made. And in the course of this process, going through those records, we came across the name of Tanya Goodwin. Boss, I think we got one. You're 43 years old. Police are presently trying to locate Ms. Goodwin, who is known to have visited Adams while at all the jail on at least two occasions. It's on the TV. And there it was, all over the news. We just sat beside each other and watched the news. It was so intense. I decided the best thing would be for her to go home and wait on the police to come interview her. Let's not get you in any more trouble. Because I knew they were going to question her. He took the phone book and um, he just started looking through a section of East St. Louis. And he's like, Tell them that you dropped me off at the McDonald's on State Street. You dropped me off and I just walked away into the darkness. It sounded easy enough. I was very confident that I could uh, convince the police officers of that. I anticipated that once the pressure got real tough, that it was a great possibility that she would roll over and tell them where I was at. But I figured that I had enough time to get away before they got there. I made a call to somebody I knew in California. I need somebody to come pick me up. They contacted somebody in Chicago to come down and get me. They're probably about five hours away. Tanya Goodwin had visited him twice in the immediate past. We needed to determine if she had talked to him, if she was cooperative, if she knew anything. Got an address for you, Jimmy? Yes, I got it. What's in? After we determined where she lived, pulled the records up, we contacted the police department for uh, the areas where she lived to go and make contact with her. There was two of them that come beating the door down. And I went and opened the door. And they were just like flying all over me. Where's your boyfriend? Claire! Claire! The other guns draw search in the apartment. Where's Quante? Where's Quante? Where is Quante? Quante, Quante. Where is Quante? He really, really scared me. I was expecting my ride to turn up in just a couple of hours. I picked him up and I took him to the McDonald's in St. Louis. That's a lie. Tell me the truth. I'm trying to tell you. Where is he? Where is Quante? I can't do it. And I told him where he was. She told us that he was in room 108 of the motel. I was one of the first cars there. What I'm thinking outside the door is he's not going to go easy because of the incredible amount of dedication to systematically escape from a, a jail. He may have a gun and may want to go down in a firefight. It's uh, scary. You don't know what's going to happen. You're on edge. You're, you're nervous. You're shaking. pretty good at getting out of the jail. He just wasn't very good once he got out. Kind of like that dog that breaks his chain. You know, once he got off, he didn't know where to go.
And don't forget, you can catch Breakout at the same time next week. Up next, though, a trip to the Isle of Ice with a pacifist priest, Cull the Conqueror. <laughs>